from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio alongside Dan Duggan, James Crash. They cover the Giants for NJ Advanced Media. They were at MetLife Stadium for another Giants loss, 30 to 10, 20 points by the Cowboys in the fourth quarter. The game's just another loss on a long season of them for the Giants. It's everything else going on around this team that we talk about really on a weekly basis. We'll get into the latest rumors on the GM search and someone they might be honing in on. Uh, the craziness around Eli Apple. Let's start, though, James, with the quarterback, with Eli Manning, a guy that we've done many podcasts and conversations about, not quite the way we have over the last month. Inserted back in as the starter, big standing ovation in the Giants on Sunday at home, got what they wanted, which was the crowd back in the corner of Eli Manning, and everyone happy again for that. But now reality kind of sets back in. The Giants are bad. Eli didn't play very well. They lost again. And yet it seems like they're just going to keep doing this. James, what's going on with Eli Manning as the starting quarterback of the Giants? I have no idea. As I I said in a video this morning, NJ.com, Monday morning, the Giants are not tanking. I don't really know what the hell they're doing. I don't think they know what they're doing. I mean, it, it just seems bizarre to me that oh, two weeks ago when, when Eli got benched for Geno, the, they said, well, we, we want to evaluate Davis Webb, and you know, we kind of want to evaluate Geno, but we want to evaluate Davis Webb. And now two weeks later, we got the PR stunt out of the way. Everybody's happy. Eli got his, you know, his Eli Appreciation Day, and, and we don't want to see Davis Webb play anymore because Steve Spagnuolo basically said – Eli is going to start basically for the rest of the year, more or less. He didn't come out and say it like that, but it, it was very evident that he has no intention of benching Eli Manning anytime soon. Not that I think he's making the call. So I just, it just seems to me the Giants are now going to stick with Eli indefinitely. There's only three games left, and you have to wonder, like, what exactly are they doing here? Because this has just become such a mess so many conflicting messages and double talk and contradictions. And at the end of the day, what are they accomplishing? They're two and 11. They scored 10 points again. They're not competitive. It's just, it's such a mess. And it just, it's really a gift when you can botch a quarterback change on both ends. And they've done that. It feels like Dan, this game yesterday, we're doing this podcast on a Monday, you know, Eli wasn't much different than he has been all year. They know what they have in Eli Manning, but now he's back in as the starter. The takeaway I have from all this, and I want to get both of your thoughts on, on maybe why this decision is going to continue to go the way it is. I wonder if part of this is John Merrick came out and said in that press conference when he made the changes last week that Steve Spagnuolo, if he wanted, would be part of the mix to be the next Giants head coach. He would at least be uh, his name would be in the mix because he's coaching them right now. Once he said that, my initial thought was, well, he's going to try his best to win all four of these games remaining. Obviously, they got blown out in this first one against the Cowboys. But if I'm Spagnuolo and I want to try to win the remaining three games, Eli Manning probably still does give me the best chance to win. So that doesn't jive with what the Giants want to do in terms of seeing what they might have with the rookie. No, I agree completely. It's, it's the, you know, the downside of an interim head coach. I mean, I think everyone uh, you know, was ready to, to throw Ben McAdoo overboard and probably didn't look ahead and see that this was kind of the possible outcome, that you put a guy in there who, you know, obviously he's going to want to be the full-time coach. So, you know, whatever plan Ben McAdoo was, was on board for, which, you know, whether that was to save his job, whether he was deluded into thinking um, that, you know, he really was going to be here next year to, you know, to see what would happen, you know, with the quarterback situation, whatever his motives were. Steve Spagnuolo's are, are cut and dried and completely clear. He's trying to, like you said, he's trying to win every game. Obviously, uh, not off to a great start, uh, you know, against the Cowboys, but he really has no motive to, to look to the future again, it's same, you know, sort of the same as we said with McAdoo all along, unless the, you know, it comes dictated, you know, from the owner's uh, suite. And, and really that's who should be making this call right now, because you don't have a head coach and a GM that are guaranteed to be here next season. Uh, these decisions are going to impact the franchise going forward for, you know, potentially years to come. So yes, Steve Spagnuolo can say, I, you know, I, I want Eli to stay starting quarterback. John Mara, you know, clearly, you know, stepped in a couple of weeks ago and said he wanted to see the young quarterbacks. Uh, nothing should change now. Um, you know, he obviously owes nothing to Spags. He's given him the interim head coaching job. He can say, listen, Steve, we have to get a look at this quarterback. Uh, you know, 
to kind of deal with it. I mean, it's, he's not a head coach you've hired and, and has some sort of long-term stake in the franchise. I mean, I just go back to you know, John Mara when he met with the media after the, the day after they bungled the whole Eli, you know, benching situation, uh, all of his points were about, you know, this isn't going to give us all the information we need, but it's better than nothing. He was saying, hey, you can't learn very much about quarterbacks running a scout team. You need to see them, you know, in a live game against a pass rush, you know, critical points in the game, see how they respond. Um, you know, so he said, whatever information we can, obviously we want, you know, because we're going to have a high draft pick and there's, you know, quarterbacks available. So you want to have as much information as possible. That logic was sound and it hasn't changed. I, you have to take the emotions out of it. They obviously took the emotions out of it too much when they sent Eli to the bench in the first place. But what's done is done. I mean, he's already had the the pity party and the and kind of the farewell tour and everyone rallied around. That's all great. You're still a football team. You still need to figure out what you're going to do with your quarterback situation going forward. So the the idea of getting Davis Webb some snaps down the stretch didn't become a bad idea just because they handled uh, you know, kind of the emotions of it so poorly with Eli. James, when you look at this thing now, as we go past this Cowboy game and the emotions are done and Eli's back and everything Dan just said, how would you approach this? Would it just be as simple as Davis Webb should start right now? Do you think this is a final game of the season thing? I mean, we don't know what they're going to do here. Gino had a shot already. This feels like now it's Eli, it's Davis Webb. Um, if you were running this thing, how do you think the best way to go about doing it is considering they just had a whole PR nightmare doing this three weeks ago? I think, look, I, well, I would put it this way. I think you have to start Eli this coming Sunday just because the idea of giving Davis Webb his first career start against an Eagles team that has got a tremendous pass rush, tremendous defense, and those guys are going to be on an emotional, you know, they're going to be all fired up given the situation they have. I mean, if you're the Eagles, you, I think that you have to win out now with Carson Wentz being hurt because I don't know if they can get to the Super Bowl with Nick Foles, but if they're playing in Philly – the whole postseason, I think they have a better chance. I just don't see how it's fair to Webb, and you're just courting disaster if his first career start, after we know that they basically, for whatever reason, will not let the kid practice much, is against the Eagles. So I feel like you have to start Eli. Personally, I would have started Webb against the Raiders if the decision was made to go away from Geno. I would have had Webb, now that once Eli was benched, I would have had Webb play against the Cowboys. But I feel now... You have to have Eli start against the Eagles just because you can't put Webb out there for the first time against Philly. But Webb has to start, if we're if any logic is going to prevail, against the Cardinals in Week 16 and then against the Redskins in Week 17. But here's the thing. Even if the Giants' sanity does hit them and they start Webb in Week 16, then we're going to get to Week 17 and it's going to be like, oh, we, we got to let Eli start to have like his second or third swan song. It just – it feels to me – like, all the Giants are really doing right now is, one, trying to make it so fewer angry people call in the WFAN. And, two, they're trying, it seems like, to just appease Eli. I really wonder if if they are scared to death that Eli is going to walk out on them and demand to be released after the season. And they are doing everything they can to unring the bell and try to make up to Eli in the hopes that he'll come back next year and potentially be their bridge to uh, a draft pick or to Davis Webb or to whoever. It just feels like they realize that they betrayed Eli and are doing everything they can to make it right. But I don't know if they can make it right in the end. And at the end of the day, if you don't play Webb at all this year and the season end, Eli goes, you know, hey, I was the good soldier, but now you need to release me. What have you accomplished? Nothing. I'll just jump in there. I, I don't know that would be the worst thing for the Giants. I mean, again, they already they already mangled the public relations with Eli. So the fact that they did that, you know, McAdoo took the fall, whatever you want to say, they went through that process to just turn around and erase it a week later. Again, I understand why they had to start him. You know, Spags' first game, you could not have Geno starting that game. You'd have former, former players and you'd have fans, you know, rioting in the parking lots and in the stands. I understand that. But still, long term, the damage has been done. You don't need to make it up. I mean, listen, Eli has not played great this season. I fully understand it has not. You know, the offensive line has been not good and has not been, you know, tailored to his skill set. I understand Odell and the wide receivers manager. I understand all of that. You still can't look at Eli and say, like, he's in the class of these Carson Wentz and these, you know, the guys who are playing at a super high level this season. He's just not. I mean, he's 37 years old. He's always been an inconsistent quarterback. Um, you know, there's, there's signs that the end is near. So, 
the one thing you could say that Matt did is at least he took all the heat. He took all the backlash. Again, I understand you have to get Eli back in for that home game on Sunday. But you don't need to start fully repairing that relationship. Just let it play out. It's a business. You know, if Eli... His feelings are so hurt that he comes and asks you to get released after the season. It might be a blessing in disguise. I know no one probably wants to hear that. And it's not the way you want to, him to go out. But the damage has already been done. Don't worry about smoothing it over. Just get through these next three games. You'll have a new GM. You'll have a new head coach. They're going to make the decision, you know, on what the future is with Eli. There's no lifetime contracts. There's no, you know, you're going to start forever because you won two Super Bowls. You have to start, you know, looking at it in a cutthroat manner, which they did, again, to an extreme, but to, to reverse course and say, now we're just going to coddle Eli. So, so Eli's happy. No, I mean, he gets it as much as he was emotional. He understands. He even said that he understands the notion of, you know, sitting him and playing young guys when the team is 2-10, and 10, now 2-11. and 11. So I, I think you have to not worry quite so much about his feelings because you've already done, you know, basically the worst thing you can do to the guy in terms of the way they handled that benching, you know, before the Raiders game. I think now it's time to just kind of proceed, uh, you know, a little bit more pragmatically and not worry so much about the sentiments. You know, I agree with what Dan said 100 percent. I mean, I think we're all in agreement that I think at the end of the day, the Giants moving off from Eli is probably the best thing for their franchise, given his age, given the situation they're in, given the fact they have a new coach, a new GM, a high draft pick. But what I come back to is the way that they go back and forth. I mean, look, if John Mara had blown into the facility on Wednesday after a day after Eli was benched and fired Ben McAdoo and fired Jerry Reese and put Eli back in the lineup, that would be one thing. But he let it happen, and then he's trying to go back on it. And I just don't think he seems to realize, if that's indeed the case, what they're doing, that the damage is done. Like, stop trying to undo the damage because you're just creating even more damage if you're going to keep running him out there and not see what the web kid can do. All right. For the most part, I agree with you guys. And I've kind of been on with you the whole time. Like this doesn't make any sense that what they're doing really in any aspect. But let me play devil's advocate here, Dan, for a second on the Eli thing. Does it matter at this point of the season? I could, you know, I'm going to make the case that they've seen Davis Webb since training camp. The guys that are in that front office, and I don't know if they're going to do a clean sweep, if they'll keep some scouting guys. We know obviously Reese is gone, but they probably have an idea of his skill set of where he is right now. And maybe they have an idea of his projection moving forward. Are the last two or three or maybe even last game in general, one game, going to make a big difference if the Giants, let's say, are going to draft Josh Rosen or Sam Darnold Mm -hmm. or they're going to turn this franchise over to Davis Webb? Do you think it's that big of a deal that they see him compared to whatever this PR thing is with Eli? No, I mean, I totally understand that logic, and, and, you know, that's the pushback I've caught in a lot when I've put out the idea that they should play web on social media. Well, you can't learn anything about a rookie playing behind this offensive line, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine. Again, there's just nothing to lose. That's my counter I keep saying. There's nothing to lose. You're 2-11. They're scoring 10 points a game in Eli's last three starts. There's nothing to gain by playing Eli, even if you want to keep Eli, which is fine. I'm not ruling that out. When I said that maybe it's the best case if he wants to, you know, be released after the season, I could see a scenario where he comes back. I think he'd be a great guy to, if, if he's willing to do it, to be that bridge guy. You know, you draft the guy in the, you know, the second pick, let Eli be the starter next year, and then hand over the reins, you know, a little bit more orchestrated and gracefully after next season. I'd be fine with that. But even if that's the case, nothing Eli Manning needs to show you in these last three games. I mean, there's plenty of evidence of who Eli Manning is, blah, blah, blah. So if you're saying that, you know, Davis Webb, he plays unbelievably these last three games. It's probably not going to deter you from taking a quarterback the number two pick. It shouldn't deter you. And if he's terrible, it doesn't mean he's going to get cut. It's just the entire you know football operation is about gaining information and evaluating players. So it's just in your best interest to gather as much as possible. And they're in a unique situation where they have this opportunity. You don't want to be two and eleven, but it does afford you that opportunity. You know why was Darius Powell active yesterday? He's been on the practice squad basically for two years. Well. He's a young wide receiver. They've obviously seen some things they like. Let's throw him out there. You make, you know, Tavares King, a journeyman who probably doesn't have a long-term future with the team. You make him a healthy scratch. Nobody bats an eye. I understand quarterback is different. I understand Eli is different. But, I mean, the idea that Davis Webb is like this this little, you know, frail little like chicken egg that you can't crack. I mean, if he goes out there and stinks, it, it's okay. I mean, he's played quarterback his whole life. This idea that he's just not ready. I, you know, I've made a joke on social media. They're not pre- preparing him to do open heart surgery. We're talking about going in and playing quarterback in a football game. And, listen, you know, Nate Peterman threw five picks for the Bills in, in a half. He's, he's still, you know, living and breathing. I mean, it, the, the guy will survive if he doesn't play well. Uh, I mean, but it's just the idea that there's nothing to, there's nothing to learn by Davis Webb, so don't even bother. I mean, 
there's nothing to gain by playing Eli, so at least give Davis a shot. Maybe he doesn't light it up, and you can trade him, or, or he lights it up, and then he carries that over into the preseason next year, and he lights it up in the preseason. And again, it just boosts his trade value. There's just nothing to lose. You, you can definitely make a case there's not much to gain, and I really can't argue that, but I think the, the other end of that of nothing to lose is a much stronger uh, argument to just give the kid a shot because, again, you're not in these situations often where you're playing completely meaningless games. So, you know, try to make the most of it. James, Dan just mentioned there, and I, I'm, I think a lot of people probably think this too, that, you know, the back and forth here is just craziness. And, and everything they've done so far is just odd. If you move forward past this, right, let's say they keep Eli in as a starter next year. I'm under the impression now, that considering the way the Giants – obviously don't know how to handle this and obviously don't know how to handle Eli in terms of the fans, in terms of reaction. Like, I can't imagine them keeping him for next year. Maybe he would be a good soldier. Maybe he would change his mind and be like, whatever, you sit me when you have to sit me. But I just think considering how this is all going, I can't imagine now, let's say they get through this, they just play him the rest of the year. I just can't see them bringing him back and drafting Sam Darnold at the number two pick and saying, Eli's coming back. He's going to be the good soldier. He'll be our starter. And when Sam's ready, he's going to play because we're going to do this whole thing again next year. And they obviously can't handle this from, a, I think, a mental standpoint, but also a practical standpoint. Are, are you starting to change your mind on Eli's future based on how they handle this, or are you not there yet? Uh, I'm not really there yet. I mean, I, I think that one of the things – and look, I wrote – that a couple weeks ago, they were delusional if they actually thought Eli would be back in 2018 as a team. But if they're just, I mean, like, it sounds crazy, but like, are they going to offer Eli an extension after the season? Are they going to offer him more money? I mean, what is it, like, how determined are they to, like, keep Eli in the fold? And to what extent will they go to keep Eli in the fold? And everything I keep on coming back to is, okay, the Giants currently have the number two pick if the season ended today. I don't think they're going to get ahead of the Browns for number one. Uh, I do think that they'll hold off the Niners and, and the Colts for the second pick because I don't see the Giants winning another game. And my guess is that San Francisco will probably win another game because Jimmy Garoppolo is playing hard and they're kind of coming together. And Indianapolis, they're so com- they're kind of always in these games. They'll probably luck into one more win. Let's say Darnold doesn't come out for the draft, which a lot of people think is possible. And let's say that whoever the Giants have the top of their board uh, at quarterback is taken by the Browns at number one. Well, what happens if, you know, we, we know that Josh Rosen and Baker Mayfield have some off-field questions. We know that this guy, Josh Allen from Wyoming, is kind of, seems like he's going to be someone who either gets a GM to the, the Hall of Fame or he gets someone fired in, in a blaze of glory. What happens if the Giants are sitting at two, the Browns take their top guy, and they don't feel comfortable taking one of the other two quarterbacks if Darnold is still in school? I mean, what are they going to do? Trade down? Then you don't really have a quarterback. Then you've got Davis Webb, who you've never seen play, presumably, and what? You're, you're spending whatever money you saved by letting Eli go, you're basically spending on Ryan Fitzpatrick, Josh McCown, you know, whoever, Sam Bradford. To be, it's just the Giants don't seem to have a plan, and they don't seem to realize that if Eli wants out, or they the new GM says uh, we got to move on from Eli, they could get themselves boxed in with no good options going forward. Before if they we don't touch, see Webb. before we touch on uh, Dan the, the the Gettleman news and and maybe the latest on the Giants GM search and whatever the heck's going on with Eli Apple, just to to wrap up this Eli conversation. Because of the uncertainty in the front office, because the uncertainty with Spagnuolo as, I guess, the de facto leader, the interim head coach of this football team right now, and no GM yet hired, doesn't John Mara have to retake the reins on this whole thing? Like, he's got it. He's the only one there that's going to be there next year, at least definitely. He's the owner of the team. I just feel like leaving all of this to the guys that are running the football operations day to day, Kevin Abrams, you throw him in the mix, just doesn't make any sense. I mean, those guys... They might not be here. They weren't trusted to be the leaders of this team anyway to start the season. They were behind the scenes or a secondary leader, and yet they're making these decisions. This whole thing just – John Mara's got to re-step back in like he did two weeks ago. 100%. I mean, yeah, like you said, this will kind of put a ball in it because it's, it kind of you know envelopes a lot of the points we've made throughout this last two weeks. I mean, they handled the, – I'll say it again. They handled the Eli situation wrong before the Raiders game, but the football thought process behind it was completely sound. Now you definitely could say they, putting Geno Smith in the middle of it was a was a problem, and they should have just gone right to Davis Webb. No problem with that. 
McAdoo kind of hamstrung him there because he didn't get the kid ready at all. I mean, you got to give him some practice reps. The, the thing now, you uh, kind of sidetrack for a second. If we want Davis up to start a game, he's got to at least be the number two quarterback in a game. I mean, you know, I was talking to someone, got a you know pretty thorough breakdown of you know how practice works uh, for the Giants. I'm sure it's you know pretty similar around the league. They don't do nearly as many like team periods as you might think, or if you go to training camp, you see a ton of them. They do something like 24 offensive you know, pr- plays and in, in like the two busiest practices, the two most productive practices and like 16 in the other. So it's, you know, whatever, I'm not doing the math that great in my head, but whatever the number is around like 60 plays a, a week in practice. And the number one quarterback when it was Eli, you know, took, you know, pretty much, I'll say, let's say 50 out of those 60 reps. Now, Davis Webb is just working on the scout team. At least if he's the number two quarterback, he's getting those 10 extra reps with the first team offense and, and, you know, actually running the Giants plays, not running, you know, the opponents plays. I mean, again, these, these aren't a ton of reps, but at least it'd be something. So, you know, that's where they were kind of put behind the eight ball there by just not even having him remotely prepared. He has to be the number two quarterback this week. I mean, I, I just I can't even fathom a reason why he wouldn't be. But so just get, now to get back on track. Uh, yeah, it has to be John Mara. Again, he sort of started the ball rolling. I mean, I know that he said Jerry Reese and Ben McAdoo had discussed it, but Ben McAdoo, when he was first asked about playing Davis Webb, you know, around the bye, said, it's a discussion I'll have with Jerry and ownership. Ownership is going to be involved in a decision that involves, you know, the beloved franchise quarterback who's won you two Super Bowls. So uh, Mara was always going to be involved. And I just really think the PR hit is driving this kind of reactionary decision with the quarterbacks and it's abandoning what was again a sound football approach and again i understand why they did it on sunday they had to appease the fan base they couldn't have you know the team walk into you know, what would have been awaiting them with geno smith uh, you know starting over eli in that, that first home game but now the damage has been done mara has to step back say listen specs yeah i agree with james Eli has to start against the Eagles, but say, listen, Spags, we need to at least get Davis Webb a look. I mean, listen, he, Spags has been a good company man. The Giants have been good to him. He has to understand, you know, from a football perspective. So, listen, start Eli, make Webb the number two. Then I would start Webb the final two games. But even if not, then maybe you start to go back to a little bit of that plan that, you know, was kind of so ill-conceived where Eli starts and, and you know, Webb's coming in at some point. You know, that, that again, it might be dicey to navigate, but uh, I totally agree with, you know, your sentiment that Mara has to be the one. You can't leave it up to Spags because uh, he doesn't have a long term future with the team. So it needs to come from on high. And again, Mara already showed once that he was willing to kind of stick his nose in there. So now to backtrack, uh, you know, doesn't isn't a great look, in my opinion. He needs to just, you know, be assertive, uh, you know, stick to his convictions and again, just kind of follow through on the plan uh, that was hatched weeks ago. All right, guys, let's talk a little bit about what we heard, I guess, over the weekend into Sunday morning. James, what's the latest on on these rumors out there with the Giants, I guess, the GM search? And that will lend itself to the coaching search, obviously. But Dave Gettleman, that's the name that's been out there. You guys have written about this. This, I think, was a name that we knew would come up. But the Giants obviously could talk to him now, which could change maybe the timeline of this thing um, if they wanted to. And then the idea of of whatever that was with John Dorsey last week, maybe the part of the reason the Browns hired him so fast when they, they cut Sashi Brown is because maybe the Giants had interest. What's, what's the latest we're hearing here? Yeah, so obviously it sounds like the Giants intended to interview John Dorsey. The Browns moved quickly. Uh, kind of weird for the, you know, we had it with the head coach in 2016 with Hugh Jackson, and now with this, that the Browns kind of, outmaneuvered the Giants, sort of say. Although I, I think in this is a situation, it seems like the Browns were pretty far down the road with Dorsey, and that was kind of the same thing with Hugh, where the Giants, they were interested in Hugh, but you know the Bengals lost their playoff game, I think, on like a Saturday night. The Browns were sitting in a hotel in Cincinnati on Sunday morning to interview Hugh, and the Giants didn't even ask permission to speak to Hugh until like 48 hours after that playoff game. But no, I think Dave Gettleman was a name we, we all kind of – brought up immediately because he, he was with the Giants organization for 15 years. Uh, he had some success in Carolina, although that success has become highly debated on Giants Twitter. I've been kind of surprised that the, the, the overall backlash against the possibility of them hiring Gettleman, who at this point, if I had to make a guess, if I was placing a bet in Vegas, I would bet the Gettleman will be the eventual hire just because I think he checks a lot of, of boxes. But uh, I've been really not surprised. I, I get the whole idea that people think it's the same old, same old. But to that point, I mean, Gettleman, he wasn't the best GM in the world with the Panthers, but I do think he was more successful than 
angry giant fans are kind of giving him credit for. I, I do think he's a hire that would – it's not a, it's a low risk hire in my opinion because he's 67 years old. Uh, he's probably not going to be the GM long term. But I look at you know some of these other popular names from outside. There is a significant kind of risk, boom or bust potential with a guy like Nick Casario or Elliot Wolf that I just don't think exists with Gettleman. I do think the Giants will do some sort of search. I don't think they'll hire a guy before the season ends, but I do think at this point Gettleman is the favorite. And if I had to guess who they're going to hire, I would say him. Dan, what are your thoughts on on the process here for the Giants? Do you think this is going to be a longer one? Because we talked about all those potential names last week, and if they're all involved, it would obviously lead into January because some of those guys will be on teams now, still with teams, and you have to wait till their season ends. Or could you see this thing going quick, uh, maybe not as quick as the Browns, but quick if the Giants do like somebody like a Gettleman? Yeah, no, I mean, I know there's a report out there uh, Sunday night that, you know, Gettleman could be hired by midweek this week. I'd be shocked if that's the case. Uh, Every indication I've heard uh, is that he's the favorite. And as James said, if I was putting money down, I would, you know, put it on Gettleman. But I do believe they're going to at least wait until after the season. Um, I mean, I got to refresh on the rules. I think that they can interview. Obviously, once a team is, you know, either doesn't make the playoffs or eliminated, uh, you know, anybody can interview. But I believe it's the same deal as with head coaches like Casario or something like that. I think would be available if the Patriots get a first round buy off to double check that. But needless to say, most of the candidates they're going to be interested in, they should be able to, you know, interview in that first week in January. So, you know, if I could sit here and say right now, Gettleman's the favorite, why don't they just hire him? Well, I think you at least sit down with those guys. And if someone just knocks your socks off, you say, oh, well, you know, maybe this is the way we want to go. Uh, I don't think they will go that way because I, I just think that. For all the talk of wholesale changes, you know, John Mara is I just can't see him handing over his franchise to, you know, complete unknowns, complete outsiders. Gettleman is just such a comfortable fit. The guy's, you know, was in the in the front office, you know, for over a decade. Uh, you know, clearly, um, you know, there's a longstanding relationship there. He knows how the operation is run. He'll, you know, almost assuredly keep pretty much the entire front office, you know, in tow, including Kevin Abrams, who, um, you know, will get a, you know, get a look as the permanent guy, but he's someone who I would keep around. I mean, he's, he's proven to really, you know, manage the salary cap and, and contract negotiations. Well, whatever you think about the money the giants have spent on some of these contracts, the way they've manipulated the cap to make everything fit, uh, you know, has been well done. So, um, you know, as far as the kind of the, the public reaction, I put a poll out yesterday morning when, you know, the, the report started picking up about Gettleman being the favorite and it was 70, 30 against as far as the Giants fans want him to be the new GM. And pretty much the overwhelming reaction I've gotten is one that I fully understand is you can't get up there and say, you want a complete overhaul and then just go hire a guy who kind of just feels like, you know, just Jerry Reese, if, you know, a few years older, you know, he's, he came through the same tree. He's been, you know, an Ernie, of course, he protege, um, you know, I know obviously he's a different guy, but it, it just feels too in the family tree when you basically said we need to tear it down and start over. And it just feels like, a, you know, kind of another half measure the same way they went from Coughlin to McAdoo when clearly they probably would have been better off, uh, you know, exploring an outside option there. Um, but even as far as Gettleman, I don't think he's going to be like an abject disaster. I mean, he showed in Carolina that he's you know, certainly capable uh, of putting a winning product on the field. Now, the fact that he rubbed some players and some agents wrong with the way he dealt with contracts, I mean, Jerry did too. And it does, that doesn't rule you out as far as being an effective general manager. And in some ways, it's a good thing. You don't, again, you don't want sentimentality, uh, you know, determining how you make, you know, tough roster decisions. If, you know, veterans are going to be mad when you cut them. Okay, big deal. You know, you won't get invited to their, uh, you know, their birthday party. <laughs> I think Dave Gellman is fine with that. Um, so I, I, the way I actually, I made a comparison, me and James were talking about this for the game yesterday. He almost feels like he could be like an Evan Engram. Like when he got drafted, everyone's like, what? The draft, and, you, know, of, you know, kind of a speedy tight end. This is not what this team needs. They need to get an offensive lineman. If, if they hire Gettleman, it's going to be like, oh, why are they getting someone from the, you know, the Giants family tree? But Evan Engram has turned out to be, you know, a competent player. You might say that they would have been better off with, uh, you know, offensive tackle, but doesn't mean Evan Engram's incompetent. I kind of feel the same way with Gettleman. People won't be excited by the hire. But he could very well come in and do a good job because, again, I mean, whatever, uh, you know, things didn't end well in Carolina and there certainly, you know, wasn't like he had this, you know, perfect resume there. But he wasn't a disaster. I think that the, the floor is pretty high with Gettleman. Maybe the ceiling isn't as high as you might feel like it is with uh, Elliot Wolf or Nick Casario, and, and that's totally understandable. But, I mean, I think if he does get the job, uh, you know, I don't think that the franchise will implode. I think he knows what he's doing. Uh, but the other consideration there, too, is he's 66. So are you just hiring him? 
to kind of groom Kevin Abrams to take over. I mean, maybe that's not the worst approach. It seems like a very Giants type approach. You know, kind of just keep it, you know, in that George Young, Ernie Acorsi tree and, and keep it rolling like that. So I think that's probably the most likely outcome. And But I totally understand, you know, why Giants are opposed to it. I think I'm a little bit more against it than James is because um, I, I think they need to go outside. I think that uh, it's kind of gotten stale. Uh, it's time to shake things up. And it's just really hard for me to get too excited about it. You know, a 66 year old, um, you know, who's from that same tree. Yeah, but I, two things. One, the age. I mean, yeah, fans are like, oh, he's 66. He's going to be 67, I think, in January, February. But at the same time, I told these guys, hey, I got a 70 year old guy in Jacksonville that we can get bring back. They would have a par- they'd have a parade in East Rutherford for Tom Coughlin to be back. One thing about the rules is that. The GM rules are a lot murkier than the coaching interview rules. You know, the coaching interview rules, they have the rules that like if a guy, if his team's in the first round bye, he can do it during the bye, or, or the guys can interview after the first round playoff game. The way, from my, the way I read it, understand, work it with the GMs is you really you can't hire these guys until the season ends. You can interview them while their teams are still playing, but it sounds like that's a team decision. So if they don't give you permission to do the interview, you've got to wait until that candidate's team is eliminated or their season ends. So the Giants, if they have all their ducks in a row, they could you know, interview Abrams, interview Gettleman right before the season ends. You know, If the Packers don't make the playoffs, they can move on a guy like Elliot Wolf quickly. Uh, but the thing about Wolf is he's kind of been burned by this. I believe in 2016, the Lions really were interested in him, but the Packers said, or who were in the playoffs, they said, you can't interview him until we're done. The Lions said, we can't sit around and wait, and they moved and they hired Bob Quinn. You know, I think a guy like Casario, yes, the Patriots are obviously going to be playing probably all the way up to the Super Bowl, but I would assume Bill Belichick is going to let Nick Casario go interview with the Giants during the bye week, knowing the situation in hand. So I think there's a chance that if the Giants time it right and other teams are willing to work with them, they can bang out all their interviews pretty quickly for the GM, you know, side on a guy. And look, we all know that, you know, people are talking and whispering behind the scenes. Then they can move on and start interviewing a head coach and have their guy sort of a prize of the situation. I think if you're going to interested in a guy like McDaniels or Jim Schwartz, I mean, people are going to know who he is and the GM can kind of from afar consult and be part of the process. So I do think that the Giants will interview outside candidates. And if they kind of handle this right, they can move pretty quickly and still kind of get Gettleman or whoever decided relatively quickly once the season ends. So, we'll, I mean, this thing will continue to, I'm sure, have, have legs to it, whether it be Gettleman or anybody else they're going to try to talk to over the next couple of weeks. If anything big happens, obviously you guys will be on it, and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Let's, let's wrap this one up by coming back full circle with another Eli, Dan, as <laughs> Eli Apple didn't play again on Sunday. He hasn't played now four straight games. I'm looking on his Twitter page. He's retweeting a bunch of things yesterday while the game's going on, including a tweet from his mom tweeting him, which is just like, that, that seems like the Apple family right there. What's going on here? I mean, this guy last year showed a lot of promise, rookie, top 10 pick. And, you know, my first thought was, like, he's not playing. He wasn't playing under McAdoo. And I thought maybe that was a weird Ben McAdoo discipline thing that no one really understood. But, like, what's what's happening here with Eli Apple? Why isn't he part of this team right now? <sighs> it's It's a mess. I mean, you know, you're talking about a guy who was a lot of people didn't think he should have been a top 10 pick last year. Uh, there was immaturity, red flags, you know, in the scouting report, we all kind of remember that infamous report that he couldn't cook. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny how scouts kind of hone in on something like that to make their point. But it feels like it wasn't as crazy as it seems that just more the the life skills kind of aren't there. I mean, you mentioned his mother. Uh, not too many other NFL players have their mother as, as quite a big presence in their life. And listen, hey, I love my mom, and and uh, it's great that they have a close relationship. I think she needs to kind of stand down. We all remember her, you know, injecting herself into the Josh Brown thing, which made things super awkward, um, you know, for her son last year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the way he handles things is just, he just he, he needs a, a PR consultant or something. I mean, you know, the fan base, you know, you know, wants his head. He's inactive yesterday for the fourth straight game, and there's never even really been a straight answer on why he's been inactive. He's, you know, he's been on the injury report the last two weeks, but he says he's healthy. The team doesn't really say he's out because he's hurt. It's always, oh, he didn't get a practice reps. I mean, everything is just so murky. But so anyway, so he's, he's sitting out. Uh, he's inactive, but he's still at the game. 
and he's tweeting during the game, which you're not allowed to do even if you're inactive. I guess that's you know part of the NFL social media policy. And he's just tweeting stuff that you shouldn't tweet. <laughs> it's again, it's like uh, you know the uh, Rod Smith, the Cowboys running back with the you know a couple of backbreaking touchdowns in the fourth quarter. An Ohio State fan Twitter account, you know tweeted something about rod smith you know icing the giants with a touchdown and eli apple retweets that i mean come on and, and then someone calls him out on and he says something like I'm, i'll always be a buckeye yeah that's great you know put the varsity jacket away you're in the nfl now you, you know ohio state stuff is great you want to root the team on on saturdays that's fine you can't be cheering for a player who just you know beat your team the team you, you have to go in the locker room and face the guys who just got burned by rod smith and you're basically endorsing that it was such a great play um, you know, someone else asked him why he wasn't playing, and he said, "I'm too healthy," with like a shrugging emoji. I mean, that's where we're at now. We're we're deciphering the emojis in his tweets. Um, I mean, it's just not. I mean, it's just such a bad look. And and it's, again, you don't solve all the problems by firing Ben McAdoo and Jerry Reese. Uh, and I think the new GM uh, and coach. You know, we talked about some of the big decisions with the guy like Eli Manning, probably you know number one, and the Odell contract's gonna be a huge thing. But what they do with Eli Apple is gonna be a big thing because again, this is a you know first round pick. You have Eric Flowers the year before, who he's looking like he won't see a second contract. Eli Apple has shown some talent when he's in there. He obviously got off to a terrible start on the field this season, uh, but did rebound a bit. But it's just all these little off-field stuff. I mean, he got benched for three series earlier in the game, even though the team tiptoed around it. Uh, saying that it wasn't a benching, but then it came out that it was a benching. I mean, they, it's just been such a mess. And again, he doesn't do himself any favors. Um, you know, there was, of course, the report in the New York Post where someone in the Giants organization was obviously wanted to, you know, trash the kid and, uh, you know, shared what happened when he, he didn't react well to that kind of infamous uh, honest team meeting. And the, there was a plays in the 49ers game where he clearly just totally mailed it in. Uh, so this, this, there's a lot there. It's like when you try to tell the Eli Apple story, you have to you know keep going back to oh, then there was this incident and this incident. Uh, that's never a good thing when you know kind of your your rap sheet, so to speak, uh, is quite that long with off field stuff. And again, I'm saying rap sheet, you know, as a metaphor. Um, I he's just he just needs to grow up. I think that's all it comes down to. I mean, it's it's time to realize you're a professional athlete. Um, you know, he had some tweet, even the people didn't like where he said, you got to smile through adversity. And some people say, well, maybe, you know, kind of bear down through adversity and, and, you know, show a little fight <laughs> rather than just, you know, keeping a smile on your face. So uh, it seems like everything he does just is, is wrong and it isn't well received. Uh, so I really don't know where they go from here. I mean, there's three games left. Spag said he hopes that he plays. I mean, you, I, I mean, it's just tough. It's, it's really tough. I mean, to have a first round pick and, and be in this position, you know, not even two full seasons into his career. Hey, James, who plays more the rest of the season, Davis Webb or Eli Apple? That's a great question. Uh, I, I, I want to say neither guy, but, I mean, I, I, I guess – I, I, I don't know. I, I would say push. I, I just think – and, look, we're taking this on a Monday morning. The Giants will have the locker room open Monday afternoon. I'm intrigued to see what happens because I, me, myself, and a couple other reporters – we, we ran into Eli Apple in the, in the hallway outside the locker room after the game on Sunday, and he basically, he's very polite, and he basically like, I can't talk to you guys. And he implied that like he wanted to talk to us, but the team had told him he, he couldn't talk to us. It, it's just – it's very weird, and I think one thing. He's got to be careful because I, I believe I'm correct on this. If the team were to suspend him, which – They've suspended the other two cor- prominent cornerbacks already this year. I think that wipes out all his guarantees in his contract. As a first-round pick, everything's guaranteed. So the Giants would be taking a major dead cap bath if they were to move on from him after the season. But if guarantees are wiped out, and I, I'm not 100% sure that would be the case with the team suspension. I think it would be. All of a sudden now, you know, you're looking at a situation where it's a lot more feasible to kind of move on from him. But I think Dan's right. You know, he's not like Eric Flowers in the sense that he's been he struggled on the field, but he has shown flashes of being, you know, above average NFL cornerback. So I think that makes it more difficult. There's always something to talk about this Giants team. We got the Eagles coming in on Sunday. They got a whole mess with their quarterback situation. We'll come back next week, talk about it. The, the GM search, the team, the quarterback situation. James, as always, thanks for doing this. You got it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hey, thanks a lot, Joe. You got it, guys. Everyone, talk is cheap. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. That's where you can find us. Subscribe. Get our episodes right away. Thank you, as always, for listening right here on NJ.com.